that there are other uh, burdens that people come and also other joys uh, that you want to celebrate. Um, I pray or ask you to lift those up silently as we pray together. Uh, please join me. Lord God, we don't know why you chose to speak into the nothingness and call forth light. But you did. And we don't know why you separated seed from soil, but you did. We don't know why, nor did we ask you to mold us from the clay and make us humans, but you did. We don't know why you chose to breathe into us the spark of life and fill us with curiosity and wonder and affection and love and responsibility, but you did. And we don't know why when we shirk that responsibility, when we turn from each other, when we hid in fear and sought selfishness rather than open-handed joy, you still sought us. You sought us through the patriarchs and through the prophets, from the judges and through the law. We don't know why, but you did. And we don't know why you chose to become one of us to be one with us, but you did, to expose yourself to the inattention and misunderstanding, the abuse and the ridicule, and the torture and brutal death, but you did. And Lord, we do know why you rose again, because death is not greater than the creator, and our sin is not greater than your love for us. So with joy, we thank you that not only have you made creation and appointed it so wonderfully uh, for us to continue to discover and explore, and exercise responsibility and contribute to, to know each other and to know you and to walk with ever increasing wonder. But you have called us to that. And we thank you that you've intervened to be on our side. Lord, we confess that in this world we do have trouble, just as Jesus experienced and promised that we would, we do too. And we don't know why we have to endure, some of us, long years of frustration or disappointment or grief or sorrow. But we do know this, that you're the God of bringing life out of death, calling into existence beauty where there was nothing of understanding where there is only confusion, of new hope where there was despair. We thank you for that. We thank you for the hysteric, historic reality of Christ and his resurrection. We thank you for the gift of your spirit that mediates to us and dwells within us that power. May we live with faithfulness and with courage and with good hope, no matter what the trial is before us, the unknowns that face us. We pray that we would walk with the same courage as Christ, saying, not our will, but thine be done. And to move, not just with a thin grasp on a vague hope, but rather with joyful confidence, as those initial disciples and Mary Magdalene, with fear and wonder and joy, embrace the good news of the resurrection and order our lives to that end. We pray this, that you would be glorified, that we would be whole, that the world would know who you are. And we pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Joe, come and read our first lesson. Our first lesson this morning is from uh, the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 
from the NRSV version. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Joe. Well, the good news of Easter is this, that something has happened, and that means something will happen. Listen for those themes in the gospel lesson. It's Matthew 28, starting with verse 1. You can find it in the pew Bibles there. Now, after the Sabbath, it was as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and he rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards shook. They became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're here looking for Jesus who was crucified. But he's not here. He's been raised, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then, quickly go and tell the disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So, Mary and Mary left the tomb quickly, with fear and with great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. But then suddenly... Jesus met them. He said, greetings. And they came to him. They took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee and they will see me there. Hmm. Here's a a story told about a Sunday school teacher had a class of third graders. And it was Easter morning. She told the story of Jesus' resurrection, she said to the kids, and guess what? What do you think the first thing he said was when he came out of the tomb? And a little girl stuck her hand up and said, I know, I know, I know, I know this. And the teacher said, what is it? What do you think it is? And she said, he said, ta-da! <laughs> well, like a gimmick or a little magic trick. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we used to have this tradition of taking a branch usually a, a sycamore or a, a maple branch and stick it in an empty, bone-empty <laughs> glass in the house, and then we would hang Easter eggs on them. And the way you'd make the eggs, well, we haven't done this in years, but you take a toothpick and poke a little hole in one end and a little hole in the other, and then you blow so hard that you're just on the verge of an aneurysm, you know, and you get that yolk out, and then you've got a little shell and you paint it. And you hang it on the tree and you have dozens of them. They were beautiful. That's wonderful. I think sometimes it's easy for us, and I'm talking to us Christians, us church-going folks, to treat Easter like that sometimes. To blow out the real substance of it and have an empty little shallow thing. All pretty. Excited. This is my Easter tie. I only wear it once a year. You know? Beautiful flowers, special meal, gathering of family and friends, and we celebrate joy because spring has come and good riddance winter. Amen. And we treat it as if it's only that. That's all it is. But that won't do. No. The resurrection is news that is not just relevant on Easter, but for every single day. Now, there's some that might object and say, oh, Greg, you're, you're taking this seriously. You're taking this literally. Why, why would you be content to believe in a fairy tale, to believe the impossible? Why, w- why would you believe something? Why would you waste your time on a wish dream? People who do that, they avoid the real life of this world. You know, it, actually, it's the opposite. If you did just a very cursory reading of the last 2,000 years of Western civilization, you'd see 
that this story, the people that have lived their life in the light of this resurrection story have not avoided life. Not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Men and women whose lives have been shaped by the story of the crucified and the risen Lord have often led the way in advancing life in this world, like learning on every single front. Medicine and science and education and the arts and letters and business and philanthropy and theater and civic service. They've been the stimulating influence towards lives of virtue and character of sacrificial contribution. They've led the charge in life-affirming causes like the temperance movement and abolition and civil rights and peace movement and living wages and child labor laws and pro-life movement. In fact, it's impossible to imagine Western civilization the way we enjoy it if you took out the influence of men and women who have lived under the power of this story and have bet their lives on it and so lived, as others might see, recklessly in their giving to others in the light of the good news of Easter. In fact, even people that criticize the church, and there's a lot to criticize about the church, not to criticize about me, not to criticize about us, But even the ones who do so, quite unwittingly, do so by borrowing the category and the values and the language and the moral understanding that has its foundations in the story of Jesus. Unwittingly, they become like Old Testament prophets, standing from the side and calling us to be what we say we are. No. It's people that live in the shadow of the cross and in the light of the empty tomb who lead the way, often to sacrificial service in life's most difficult, dark, and demanding situation. All over this globe, there are hospitals and schools and business co-ops and farms and churches because of the sacrificial lives of countless people who have followed Jesus in this resurrection life. You no doubt know of Mother Teresa, right? The the missionaries of charity. You know, their job is to care for people that nobody else wants or is prepared to look after. And she said this one. She said, the miracle is not that we do this work. The miracle is that we're happy to do it. (laughs) There's a difference there, isn't there? You know, happy to do it to wipe the drool from deformed mouths and clean festering wounds and to wipe soiled bodies and to kiss the foreheads of those on whom the stench of death clings and to be happy to do it, not out of duty or simple obligation, but for joy of participating in resurrection life. That was true of the earliest Christians The record is that they were persecuted in part because they were so out of step with the other folks around them. When they were persecuted, they did not revile back. They blessed. They took upon themselves, even out of their poverty, they took upon themselves responsibility for the outcasts. Others, infants even, and crippled or lame, who were left to die. Christians would say, we've got room for you. Come to our table. Be one of us. The prevailing culture laughed said no living in the light of the resurrection is not a delusion or a fairy tale it leads more deeply into life that is true life so where do they get that power well let's take a look back at the resurrection story for just a moment sunday morning the sabbath is passed early in the morning dawn is just breaking which means the sabbath rest had just ended And at the earliest moment possible, Mary and Mary, they go to the tomb to be there. They want to be there. Other gospels say they're going to anoint the body. This one just says they want to be at the tomb. They want to be close to the one that they've lost. They've been through the horror of Monday, Thursday, Christ's betrayal. They've been through the agony and anguish, the violence of seeing Christ crucified. They've gone through the heartache of watching him die. And here they are. They want to be with him. They need to place their love, their care somewhere. So they go to be near the dead Jesus. 
It's dead. And it's a cold, hard fact, a stubborn fact. Death feels like that. It is like that. You know, part of the joy of loving people is that we walk with them on an endless adventure of getting to discover more about them and more about the world with them over and over. And it seems like it goes on, this joy of relationship, of being known by others, knowing that we belong together. But then suddenly death reaches out its cold hand and snatches them away and it's over. For all your love and for all your care, a person's gone. It's true, we grieve them so sorrowfully, people that are close to us and young ones, people like Jesus in the prime of his life, but for everyone who loses a loved one, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're fortunate that you don't know what I'm talking about, you will. Somebody you love will be taken away to death's cold grip. And so it is with Mary and Mary. In that state, they come, confused, bewildered. What happened? Their lives have been changed, reoriented. They've been given a new way of understanding themselves and the world. And this guy, he had, as they say, the words of eternal life. When he speaks, it fills us with hope and meaning. We don't understand it, but there's something here. And now that guy, well, Rome and the religious authorities squashed him. And we're back to where we were before. But since that state, they come. They come. Something surprising happens. They see an an angel Lord descend, rolls back the stone and sits on it. I love that little fact. He sat on the stone. Probably a guy with an attitude, you know. He says, hey, I know what you're here for. You're looking for Jesus, but he raised. He's not here. The message is meet him in Galilee. Go quick. They're baffled. They're shaken. They move, it says they move with fear and with great joy. Both of those things, fear and great joy. And then the unimaginable happens. Jesus shows up. All he says is greetings, you know? And he says, here's my message. Tell my brothers and sisters, go. I'll, I'll meet them in Galilee. Something has happened. Jesus rose from the dead and something will happen. They're gonna go see him. And for these days, Mary and Mary are in the in-between. In between the announcement, a certainty that something has happened, and a promise that something will happen. They'll see him again. They'll meet him again. The resurrection is a testimony. It's an authentication, authentication rather, of Jesus' teaching. What it's, it's a stamp of approval. It says, what he said, you can trust. The way that he taught you to live is worthy. You can bank on it. It's a ratification of the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom that is already breaking in and is yet to come in its fullness. The resurrection of Jesus is the first instance of that kingdom in its all of its fullness coming. Life put back how it ought to be. There's a passage in uh, the, the book of First Corinthians. It says Jesus is the first fruits. It's an agricultural term. He's the first one to be raised, just like the first bit of the harvest is is collected. But what comes next? Well, the rest of the harvest. And and you're living that. The first fruit has already been gathered. Christ has already been raised. And you too are going to be caught up. But not until the job is all done, until death is finally vanquished. Because we live in the in-between, between what has happened and what will happen. You know, in, in the summer, uh, let me just say this. It just won't do to think that this is a metaphor, a symbol. You know, the, the ones who bore witness to this, almost every one of them died in brutal ways because of their testimony pointing to Jesus. And the word, world did not want to hear that. Eleven of the 12 disciples died in violent ways for their testimony. If they'd made it up, if I'd made it up, I wouldn't go that far. No way would all of them <laughs> go that far. You know, there, there is more historic evidence, actually, that Christ was killed in the manner it said and 
was reported raised by those who knew him and that they changed profoundly. There's more evidence of that in history than Tiberius, who was Caesar at the time, who reigned for 23 years with authority and power and military position and command and writing official. There's more evidence that this poor Jewish guy who died at the hands of the authorities, that he lived and was reported raised by people whose lives were turned upside down by that news than there is that Tiberius even existed. John Updike, some of you might know, he lived and worked just right here in Ipswich and North Bev. He puts it this way in his uh, poem, Seven Stanzas at Easter. It says, make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, then the church will fall. It was not as flowers, each soft spring recurrent. It was not as a spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the 11 apostles, as if his was flesh. It was his flesh, our flesh. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, pause, and then regathered out of enduring might, new strength to enclose. So let us not mock God with metaphor or analogy or sidestepping transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded cruelty of early, earlier ages. No, let us walk through that door. I think it's true. Is it unbelievable? Yes, yeah, it's unbelievable. That's where it derives its power. That's what fuels the church because it is seemingly too good to be true and yet all of us know, don't we, when we experience death, that this is not the way it should be, right? When, when uh, someone once said that grief is the absence of love's relation, it's no place to put that love and affection. It's gone the other, the form, and we know something is not right. It shouldn't, be this way. Well, something happened and something will happen. It's kind of like this. In the summer of 1989, is that right? No, 80, was that right? Yeah, 89. No, 90, 1990 maybe. Yeah, summer 1990. Laura and I, we just celebrated our second anniversary. I was studying theological German. She was training young folks how to do campus ministry we were weeks away from leaving our home and network and families in the Midwest and moving up here to New England, each to start new graduate programs, each to start new jobs, far away from our family and friends, excited about an adventure. And then we learned something, that something that had happened. Any guesses what it was? You have my son who's 32, is chuckling. <laughs> yeah, we were expecting our first child, something had happened, now something was going to happen. Something that would change everything, and it did. Changed our lives, changed the way we saw the world, changed the way we viewed ourselves, changed our future, and boy, it did. What a gift. Changed things. Well, that was the news, like the news that Mary and Mary received. Something had happened, and something would happen, and it would change everything. And they live in that in-between the good news of the resurrection and the promise that you'll see me again. Mm. In Jesus' resurrection, it's not all over. <laughs> but the promise is made sure. And in that promise, there's the hidden future already announces itself. It makes itself known. Easter is not the final victory, but it's the assurance that the final victory is coming. It's the beginning of the end, the assurance of what is to come. So how do we live in that in-between, in-between what's happened and what's going to happen? Death still roams about this world. Disease still cripples us. Illness keeps members not with us today. How do we live in that, despite that? Well, here's how, some of what it's like, anyhow that every time we choose hope and perseverance in the face of frustration, we're practicing resurrection. 
Every time we fail and fall, but we get up and we try again, and we're living in resurrection. Every time we have the courage to move beyond our own comfort zone and our current understanding to connect with others across race or religion or perspective, then we're living in resurrection hope. Every time we have courage to act in love rather than cruelty or violence or coldness, then we're living the resurrection. And when we choose to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive again, we're living in the resurrection. When we choose to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, we practice resurrection. And when we choose the way of righteousness and obedience, even though nothing in us wants to go that way, then we're practicing the resurrection. Every time we say, just as Jesus did, not my will be done, but thine. We're practicing resurrection hope. And each time we dare to let Jesus make us into different people, we're practicing resurrection hope. And in this way, God's kingdom comes within us. And in those ways, God king, God's kingdom comes among us. And in those very practical ways, God's kingdom comes here. People see hope and joy for knowing what has happened and what will happen. Let's live in that hope. Let's stand and sing together. 287, lift high the cross. <laughs>